All right, guys, it's finally here. The month you've all been waiting for. The time of year when you get to stow away your razors and let your inner mountain man out. No shave November. And the ladies in your life may or may not be as excited about your beard as you are. So, for your well-being and the preservation of your relationships, we have a few tips for you to share with all those men in your life ready to get started on No Shave November. Number one, live within your means. Nobody likes a half-grown, patchy, wispy beard. Number two, care for what you've been given. Guys, trust me on this. Beard oil and conditioner can go a long way. Number three, just because you can does not mean you should. And number four, remember your potential impact. Some of you may be asking, but Melissa, what do beards have to do with our faith? I'm glad you asked. These tips for managing your beard are also pretty good tips for managing your finances, and believe it or not, our faith has something to say about that. Money's a thing. It impacts us all. Sometimes we get stressed out about it, and most of the time we don't want to talk about it in church. But that doesn't mean it's not relevant. Here at TUMC, we're going to talk about finances, but we're going to do it with no shame. And we're not just asking you to give money, we're going to look at how our faith informs how we spend our money. Join us over the next month as we use beards as a lighthearted way to talk about our finances with no shame. Well, November is finally here, and we're uh, in the middle, the, the sixth day of No Shave November. So uh, some of you have started to grow out a little bit of, of face hair. Some of you, it's starting to look really good. Uh, well done. We're also in our second week of our sermon series at TUMC called No Shame November. And we're talking a little bit about what our faith has to say about our finances, but uh, this is big. I, I can't stress this enough. It's right in the title of the sermon series. We're going to talk about money with absolutely no shame. Uh, we're not going to talk about it in a way that makes people feel anxious or feel like they're beat down or, or feel like they're guilty because that's not what we think we should be doing. Um, so we've been using beards and mustaches and whatever other facial hair configuration you want to possibly imagine, whatever that guy had on the video going on right here. We're going to use those as a way to take a lighthearted look at a really kind of heavy topic. Because many of the rules that apply to our hair follicles on our face and our heads you know, they also apply to our finances. So for those of you who are starting a first beard this November, Kevin's got one going on. Well done. Uh, Carissa doesn't think it's a beard. All right. <laughs> For those of you who are starting, you'll already get this. For those of you who aren't, you've other, seen people walking around who are starting a beard, and you've seen they're probably at that stage where they're doing a lot of this, right, where there's a lot of, like, scratching the neck and scratching the beard, because the first couple days of a beard, they get really, really itchy. Guys, have you ever experienced that? Anybody ever experienced? Okay, making sure I'm on the right page. We're one week in, and this is the point where a lot of people start to give up, right? A lot of people go, you know, it's too scratchy. I'm getting kind of like, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of itching into my face. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't look good yet. It's not looking like I want it to. So this is the point where a lot of people start to give up. So to help out, I wanted to share some advice. And I, I actually grabbed a story from one of our own church members from uh, Mark Gepner, And he sent me this earlier this week. And uh, I thought it was pretty fantastic advice for those of you who were kind of in that early itchy rut. And so these are Mark's words uh, that I'm just going to read for you. Uh, we started a no-shave November contest at Garmin back in 2009. Ashley, his wife, was pregnant with Anna, their first daughter. Uh, and being the competitive person that I am, I wanted to win. Ashley had recent told me, recently told me how the prenatal vitamins she was taking to assist with the pregnancy made her hair and nails, some of you know where this is going, made her hair and nails grow really quickly. So I thought that if the vitamins made her hair grow faster, I would naturally accelerate my beard growth as well. And come to find out, it worked. Uh, it actually worked too well, and, and I got cocky, and I started to brag around the water cooler about my luxurious mane. And I accidentally let it slip about the use of performance-enhancing drugs. <laughs> Word quickly spread around the company, and the contest judges had no choice but to disqualify me for doping in a no-shave November contest, and I left the contest a shamed but freakishly hairy man. I think we've got a pic of this freakishly hairy man. 
<laughs> if y'all see him around, give him some love for that. Uh, now, for those of you who are competing in No Shave November, I've just told you how to cheat in church. Uh, and so I'm not going to ask questions, but if you came back looking like Santa Claus next week, uh, we are going to have performance-enhancing drug tests. All right. Now, so that you don't resort to doping, <laughs> I have another suggestion. There's another way to get kind of past that itchy, uncomfortable stage, and it's these things called beard oils, uh, sometimes beard balm, and, and they're kind of like uh, oils like coconut or some other oils, and they kind of nourish the beard, and they make it softer. They've got sometimes wax in there, and it kind of protects it. They, they smell good, um, and they strengthen, and they make a difference. They're designed as these things to make a difference in the comfort and the health of your beard. And there's actually a pretty big parallel between what beard oils do to our beards and what some of our scriptures have to say about our relationships to our finances. Because let's be honest, finances can be really itchy at times. They can be really uncomfortable. They can, they can make us go to that place where we really don't like to sit still. Like, I bet you, for at least a few of you, when you found out that we were preaching about money today, it was a little bit uncomfortable. Anybody ever experience a little bit of discomfort talking about money? Because I'm feeling it right now talking about money to you, right? Sometimes we get discomfort. We get uncomfortable when we try to talk about our finances, Last week, we talked about how uh, we tend to quote the phrase, money is the root of all evil. And that's uh, kind of a popular phrase. Sometimes we assume it's from the Bible. The, the Bible verse actually says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The issue isn't typically the money itself. Typically, it's our relationship to it as we want more money, as we kind of have this uncontrollable, unquenchable desire that leads us down wrong paths. Sometimes our relationship with money can even enslave us and get us on that never-ending quest for more. Sometimes it leaves us feeling anxious, wondering if we have enough. Sometimes our relationship with money, more than the money itself, can either enslave us or it can even set us free to live the way that we feel like God is calling us to live. Our relationship with money at times can get scratchy and itchy and uncomfortable. But there's a prescription for this in the Bible. It's called stewardship. Now, for most of us, the only time we ever hear about the word stewardship uh, is either in, like, movies from the 1970s and 80s when they're talking about somebody giving you a drink on an airplane or when you go to church and once a year the pastor starts to talk about money, right? Like, stewardship's not a common word that we run into. Uh, and, and true, stewardship does pay the bills of the church, and, and, but there's more to it than that. Stewardship is really important to our own lives as well. But what is stewardship? See, stewardship was really widely spread in the ancient world. It was very common. Everybody in the ancient world would have known a few people whose job, to some degree or another, was to be a, a steward. See, stewardship worked like this in the ancient world. A steward was someone who was given control of something for someone else with the expectation they would act on that person's behalf. So if you owned land... You owned a farm, but you had to travel far away. You might leave a steward in charge of your land, and they would water your fields, and they would harvest your crops, right? That was stewardship. They would act on your behalf. Or if you ran a company, and you wanted to open a second location or a second branch, you might find somebody that you trusted and give them stewardship of that second company, right? Stewardship is when you entrust someone with something and inspect, expect them to make wise choices on your behalf, now, when you look at it that way, we still have stewardship in our modern life. Your bank is a steward of your money. When you drop off your money at the bank, you expect them to invest and make wise decisions and care for your money on your behalf. Sometimes even your kids become stewards. When they get to a certain age, you might uh, allow them to borrow your car. You give them stewardship of the car with the expectation that they'll drive carefully and they'll wear their seatbelt and they won't text and drive and, and they might even have to pick up a, a younger brother or sister or some supplies at the store on their way home. Sometimes we give people stewardship to take care of things on our behalf. Stewardship is also the biblical perspective on our relationship with our finances. It's like the prenatal vitamins or the beard balm or the beard oil that allows us to have a healthy relationship with the money around us so that instead of it enslaving us, we can use it as a tool to allow us to respond to God's call for us. 
So here's how we see this in the Bible. There's a guy who really lives it out, and, and you've probably heard of him. All right, Carissa read about him before. His name is Abram. Uh, he's more popularly known as, as he's later called, which is Abraham, uh, and he's one of the big guys in the Bible. Right? He's the patriarch. We might say he's the founding father of every single person who comes after him in the Bible just about. Right? So uh, you've got like Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and then the next big name is Abraham, and everybody after him descends from him, right? So big, big guy in the Bible, and he does it all. Abraham's the founder of his people. He's the hero of his people. He goes from kind of a broke nomad with no money to somebody who really grows a great big business empire. And he has flocks and herds and land and, and all of this stuff. He has more money than you could ever imagine by the end of his life. It's an epic story of kind of hustle and hard work. He's kind of the Alexander Hamilton of his day. Maybe there's a Broadway piece ready to be made somewhere uh, with some excellent rap. Um, some of you got that. But he starts out poor. He starts out as a wanderer who hears a prayer. He has a conversation with God, and he goes to a place he's never seen or even heard of before, and he becomes fabulously wealthy. But along the way, we see that even in the midst of gaining all of this wealth, his money doesn't take over his life. He doesn't become enslaved by it. The passage we read today is a key part in his story. It's a key part in all stories. It's the story of the most important moment in Abram's life, one of those passages that we call the covenant. It's kind of like the constitution of the ancient Jewish people. It was their arrangement or their agreement with God as God entrusts them with this place called the promised land, but also sets up some rules for how they take care of it. This is the ancient Hebrew people getting stewardship of the promised land. And so God talks Abram through all of the rules and all of the expectations and all of the wise choices he's expecting Abram to make. Abram is going to get to go to this land that is just beautiful and fantastic, and he's going to live there. He's going to raise his kids there. He's going to grow his crops there. He's going to just have a great time in the promised land. But there are a few expectations that God gives Abram for how he takes care of the resources. Abram is a steward of the promised land. So the first key to stewardship that we see in Abram's story is to remember the source of all these blessings. Abram receives all of this, but the first and foremost, he's reminded that this is a gift from God. This is uh, Genesis 12, verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I give you this land to you and your descendants, no matter what Abram does to the land. All of his hard work, all of the wells that he'll dig, all of the irrigation he'll put out there, all of the fences he'll build, all of the houses he'll construct, everything that he'll do on this land over the course of his story starts first with a gift. It starts first with something that God did before Abraham did anything to deserve it. As stewards, we're called to remember the source of our blessings. And this is probably one of the toughest things for me when it comes to money, right? And it might be for you too, I don't know, but when I look at, at what I have, I tend to think about the work I did to get it. Anybody else there? You think about the late nights you pulled. You think about the extra effort you put in. It's human nature to feel the exhaustion we had from work and to feel like, well, now we deserve or we own or, or this is on us. And that's true. We're called to work hard. But that's also only part of the picture. See, the Bible puts it this way in Deuteronomy 8, 17 to 18. Uh, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. We are called to work hard. We are called to put our best efforts in, but we're also called to remember that everything we have first started with a gift. Even our ability to work and strive and pull late hours and stay after and get up early, all of these things started with the God who made us and gave things to us. Now, when we do this, when we remember that it's God who gave us all things, even our own effort, it helps keep us from getting too possessive. See, when we die, it all goes back in the box. Anyways, we can't hold on to it forever, but remembering that God gave us things keeps us from feeling too prideful, too connected, 
too possessive of our possessions. And that brings us to our second point. See, we're given stewardship of things for a purpose. Genesis 12, 2, this is God speaking to Abram. God says, I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. God gives us stuff, but God gives us a purpose for that stuff. Stuff doesn't just accumulate. We don't just keep it in our bank account to keep score or for some purpose. Instead, we're given it for a reason. Now, this is a bit of a switch sometimes. Sometimes it's easy to look at our money and say that it's ours and we'll own it and we'll own it forever. And, but that's not really how the Bible looks at our relationship with money. It's to be used intentionally for purposes around us. When I think about this, I think about all the ways that I, I spend money over the course of the month. You know, when I go buy a cup of coffee, when I uh, go out to eat and grab a meal, when I fill up my uh, car's gas tank, I think about all of that. And, and at the end of the month, I tend to look back at my budget and see, you know, how I did. Was I kind of in line with what I wanted to do and how I spent money? And, and, you know, it turns out at the end of the month that I can't really remember all of the cups of coffee I drank or all of the meals I had or all of the places I drove with that gas. But there are some things that tend to stand out pretty easy at the end of the month. See, it's pretty easy for me at the end of the month, and maybe it is for you too, to remember the places where I use that money intentionally to bless someone else. It's pretty easy for me at the end of the month to look at the places where I, I spent money to buy someone else a meal uh, and share it with them. It's pretty easy for me at the end of the month to remember the places where I, I donated to something like Good Shepherd or, or maybe to buy uh, bikes for kids on the other side of the world with our, our Kids Rock program. I find that, that for me, the places that stick out the most, the places where that money seems to have had the most impact on my life are the places where I used it to make a difference in the life of someone else. Some of you have experienced this and you know this. See, when we remember the source of our money, that it's God who gave it to us and not us, and when we stick to the purpose that it's be used for a blessing and not just for our own enjoyment, it, it helps us to feel grateful. It helps us to say thank you. There's been study after study on the impact of gratitude in our lives. We know how, how great gratitude is, right? When we feel grateful for something, we know that feeling, and it's, it's something that we enjoy, something that we wish we could have more of. All the neuroscience backs up that feeling grateful is one of the best things that you can do for your relationship. Feeling grateful is one of the best things you can do to live longer and have a, a more meaningful life. Uh, but it's also really hard to feel grateful sometimes, right? Like, it, it would be so easy if we could just say, I'm going to feel grateful today, and then we go out and feel grateful for everything. That's not how it works. For those of you who have kids, can you just tell your kids, can't you just be grateful for all that I give you and then suddenly they're going to be grateful for all that you give them? Does that work like that? Maybe it does. I don't know. <laughs> Gratitude's important, but it's tough. But there's one way that we can get gratitude. See, it turns out gratitude is a natural outpouring of us remembering that everything we have comes from someone else. And everything we have is meant to bless someone else. And just as an aside, this is true about money, but it's also true about your talents and your gifts and your passion and your time. When we put our lives this way, we find that we find gratitude for who we are and for how we spend our time. That we begin to just be overwhelmed with gratitude. I think one of the most powerful ways I ever felt this was when I was a, a teenager. I, uh, I went on a, a mission trip to this place called Croc, Mexico. It's in the mountains outside of Monterey. It's, it's kind of a little shanty town. Actually, it used to be a dump, and then people started squatting there illegally, and finally the government just said, you know, we don't want the land back. You can keep it. And so there's people that live in this one-mile, really kind of run-down place. And they build their homes out of whatever they can find in the dump. And so there will be people that will live in houses built out of, like, cardboard leaned against itself or, or plywood. It's really kind of a rough place. And when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to go to Croc. Actually, I think we've got a picture. Uh, this was me uh, covered in concrete, uh, and, and it, was, uh, it was a tough place. But I remember coming back from that trip. And I remember uh, sitting in the, the cab of the Ford pickup truck that my sister and I shared at the time. And it wasn't like the nicest truck in the world. It was a good pickup. It ran, and, and I, uh, I loved it. But at the same time, like, it, it had some dents. Um, maybe my sister and I might have added a few of those. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, it had some scratches. Uh, and I remember sitting there, pulling up as some of my other friends were driving, and they're all driving nicer cars, and they're all driving newer cars, and they don't have to share their car with family. And I remember sitting there uh, remembering 
what I'd just seen in Mexico. And I remember just feeling this powerful, overwhelming sense of gratitude. Like there was a moment where I kind of had to duck my head because I was worried that some of my friends might see me have an emotion. And, and like as a teenage guy, you can't do that, right? Um, but I remember this powerful sense that, that I was blessed and that I was grateful, but that I ought to use that for a blessing. Abram gets that feeling. In verse 7, he arrives in the promised land and he sees all that God is giving him. And he hears that all God is going to do through him. And he's overcome with gratitude. And so he gathers stones and he builds this thing called an altar. And he begins to just worship. To just give thanks and feel gratitude to God. See, so seeing our relationship with our finances as one of stewardship instead of ownership, sometimes that's the balm that keeps things from getting itchy and scratchy. Sometimes when we remember that somebody else gave us all this, it keeps us from getting proud or it keeps us from getting too attached. Sometimes remembering that it's meant for a blessing to bless others keeps us from getting too possessive. Sometimes when we remember all of these things, it helps us to have that overwhelming yet elusive sense of gratitude for what we have instead of envy or greed or desire for what we don't. Stewardship is to our finances what beard oil is to our faces, and it nourishes and cleans and softens. 